Shall I make a start then, Barbara, or do you want to say anything? Should I just? Mm -hmm. So um, welcome everyone to this um, Southwest branch Cyber webinar. Um, this is the second part of the two-part series um, on regenerative agriculture in the Southwest. So um, last week we had the first part with um, Adam Lockyer, who is a farming and uh, who is a um, advisor at the Farming and Wildlife Advisory Group. Um, he talked about the um, first principles and establishing a baseline for change. So if you have missed that um, webinar, it was recorded and you can just um, catch up on the um, Cylon web page. Um, it's not essential to follow this webinar today, um, but it's a nice addition if you have missed it. Please feel free to catch up on it. Um, from the um, Southwest branch, um, if you want to get in touch with us, we're always looking for people who are willing to um, present for us like Becky did. So if you're based in the Southwest and you have a good um, idea for a talk, then please get in touch. Um, we have now a LinkedIn page. Um, so look us up on LinkedIn um, and that's I um, Southwest branch. If you search for that, you will find us. It's a good way to um, keep in touch and to um, get in touch with the Cyber network in the Southwest. So um, a few housekeeping rules for this um, um, webinar. So any questions you may have during the webinar, please post them in the um, question and answer box. If you have general comments, then use the general chat. But for question and answer, um, the questions, please post them in the question and answer um, chat and we will try to answer them. If there are questions regarding um, anything which you need to follow the webinar, if you didn't quite um, understand, then we will try to um, answer them straight away. Otherwise, we will um, answer them at the end of the um, webinar. Um, this webinar will also be recorded. So um, if you have to leave early, don't worry. You can um, see it later on Cylon, on the Cylon page. So um, today's webinar um, will be about the Soil Carbon Project, um, which is a project which explores the soil carbon um, as a climate change solution for um, farmers and um, how this is linked to sustainable soil management and how this can um, help um, cutting emissions um, and create um, smart farms for the future. So um, our presenter, <laughs> thank you for presenting today, is Becky Wilson. Um, she's a project manager for the Farm Carbon Cutting Toolkit. This is a um, farmers-led organization which provides tools and resources um, to help farmers cutting emissions. Becky is also the research lead at Ducci College um, Rural Business School, where she's managing two projects um, with the main focus on soil carbon sequencing and manure management. So um, I hope you enjoy the talk today and um, yeah, welcome Becky. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Carbon, and it's really nice, uh, Car sorry, Carmen, not Carbon, um, I'm usually talking about Carbon, um, and uh, yeah, it's really lovely to be here this evening. Thank you all for giving up um, some of your uh, Tuesday evening to listen to me talk about uh, improving soil health and some of the experiences uh, that we've been having in the Soil Carbon Project and how that relates to the wider picture in terms of sustainable soils management and in terms of regenerative agriculture. Um, as, Car as Carmen says, I work, I wear two hats. So I work as um, project manager at the Farm Carbon Toolkit, um, you know, which helps and, and you know, the, the majority of my role there is really looking to help farmers understand practically what they can do to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, improve soil health, improve business resilience, uh, and help to sort of provide farms that are, that are fit for the future. Um, through a range of different activities. And then at Dutchy College, um, I'm research leader on a couple of agri-tech projects, hence the um, European logo at the top there. Um, the Soil Carbon Project, which I'll be talking to you about today, uh, and then a manure management um, project, which is uh, called the Farm Crap App, which is an app which helps farmers value their uh, manures and slurries uh, as a source of nutrients. Um, but yeah, uh, very much focusing on trying to understand and unpick all these things uh, around soil, carbon, emissions, resource management, and try and understand how this can transition us into uh, a new a new era for farming where we start to value some of those natural capital assets that we have in terms of soil and water and clean air um, and the other sort of values that, that we get from farming. So that's what we're going to be talking a little bit about today. 
But I thought I'd just start with this, um, uh, if my PowerPoint behaves itself, come along, do something. Um, it's gone to sleep, what's going on? There we go. Um, this lovely quote, which basically says that despite all of the things that we've done um, as, a, as a race uh, and, and, and as humans, you know, all the amazing things we've done in terms of technological advances, in terms of uh, scientific research, research and the rest of it, we still owe our existence to a six inch layer of topsoil and the fact that it rains. Soil is fundamental to life as we know it. And, and not just life as we know it, but also to all of the ecosystem processes and functions that flow from it. And as farmers, we're the ones that are in charge of managing that soil. And so that, that responsibility in terms of conserving our soil, in terms of really being able to understand how we can optimize its function, not just for those amazing ecosystem services that it provides in terms of clean air, clean water, uh, biodiversity, carbon storage, but also because it's the fundamental cornerstone of our businesses in terms of profitable farm businesses. You know, if we've got good soil, we've actually got good, resilient businesses that can adapt to those different changes in climate and all the other things that come with it. So it's just really important to think about, you know, soil is the real, should be the center point of all farming systems. And you know, soil is really our farm's biggest asset. You know, it's not currently valued on a balance sheet. If you look at a profit and loss sheet, a uh, profit and loss account of a farm, but it's the most important thing there because that having a healthy soil really helps to allow the best returns in terms of increased yield, in terms of reduced costs, all those other things from every type of farming. And when we look at farmers in terms of what farmers are trying to achieve in terms of their management and that sustainable management of our most precious resource, the basically broad aim is to keep that soil in the field to allow us to grow crops. And that might be, uh, you know, that might be arable crops, that might be horticultural crops, that might be grass, that might be trees. But basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to keep that soil in the fields in a good condition so that we can continue to start, you know, doing farming processes on top of that. If our soil is disappearing out of the far, out of the field gate, down the road and into water courses, then that's not a good thing. So we don't want to avoid that. And the other nice thing is if we start looking at the fact that those, if we can keep our soils and manage in a good condition, then that actually helps in terms of what we're trying to achieve as farmers. So well-managed soils and soils that have a good structure and a good balance in terms of their, their chemical makeup and everything else are easier to cultivate and are more able to retain the water that those crops need to sort of thrive. So we start to think about, well, actually, if we can manage our soils in a good way, we start to improve the resilience of our business. And especially if you look at some of the sort of changing weather patterns that we've had over the last few years, what's really, really interesting is, especially if you look at the last 12 months, you look at the increasing, the huge amount of water that fell out of the sky uh, over the winter months this year. You know, we had a lot of fields that were underwater. Um, you know, we had flooding in, in large areas. And then if you fast forward to the spring this year, where we went from, you know, having far too much water um, to having no water at all and going into a drought. And so how can we start to adapt our soil management systems to be able to deal with that flow of water and keep the water when we want it, make it flow more slowly through the surface and then actually stay there as a reserve, which we can use when conditions change. And as I say, there's this really good relationship between if we've got soils with good structure, then not only will we reduce the risk of that soil disappearing off the field, um, but also taking with it nutrients and organic matter, but also really start to improve and create long term savings for those businesses. So there's an economic benefit from sustainable soils management as well as an environmental one. But it's also really important to remember that soil is actually a finite resource. Um, it's a massive source in terms of carbon. It's estimated that, you know, there's 10 times more carbon in the forest than there is uh, in soils than there are in forests in the last 40 years. But we've lost some of that resource. And the problem then comes that actually it's really difficult to get that resource back. Um, you know, where we can lose soil very, very quickly, the actual process of making new soil is really, really slow. About tw over 20 years to form a millimetre of soil but we can lose it in 20 seconds when the weather conditions aren't right. And as I say, there are civilizations which seem to have thought to have collapsed, you know, due to soil degradation. And it's also really important when we're looking at food security, 
because actually a lot of our food, almost all of our food comes from managed soils. So soils are a fundamental part of this. If you add on top of that, the reasons that we're doing this, you know, for, for agronomically, so for the farm business and why, and more widely in terms of the environmental benefits, We've also now, when the agricultural bill um, you know, went out last year when we had election and then came back in again, one of the things that was included in it, which had been missed out the first time, was this thing now that soil is specifically named in the agricultural bill as a public good. And you could say, well, you know, okay, whatever. We all knew it was a public good beforehand. We did. We all knew that all these other public goods flew through, you know, uh, came through it in terms of clean air, clean water and all the rest of it. So why is it important that it's now in there? Well, it's really important that it's in there because now that means that we can hang payments off the back of it. As it's now in, you know, it means that we can start to develop, you know, systems for rewarding or incentivizing farmers who are doing a good thing. It's really good. And it also allows us to do more research. And this sort of comes down to this idea that going back to what I was just saying there in terms of soil, there's this sort of concept of soil health. And it's one of those terms that's banded around quite a lot. It's a bit like if you go back a few years when everyone was talking about sustainability. You know, soil health is one of those things which is, which is put up as something which is incredibly important, which it is. But it can also be really difficult to define. And, and how do you start to look at what soil health means? Do we have one uniform, uh, you know, one uniform definition of soil health? No, we don't. It means different things to different people. And also, how do we look at where... Soil health relates to crop health and animal health and ultimately human health. And how do we start to trap the fact that if we can improve the health of our soils, if we can improve the structure of our soils, then actually we can start to facilitate that transfer of nutrients up through the soil to the plant, through the animal, if it's going via the animal, and then finally to people. And that's when it gets really exciting in terms of how we can start to transition our farming systems to these new more regenerative ways of farming which start to look and view these things as a whole so we're not just looking at one part of the system we're looking at how we can make changes to our soils which actually are then magnified throughout the system and allow us to really start to have different conversations around looking at nutrient density of food and looking at other exciting things which are coming but as I say, we get back to this issue of, of this term that's used quite a lot, but actually how do we define it? What's included? Are we just talking about soil as an entity and how healthy it is in terms of its structure or its nutrient content or its balance of nutrients? Or are we starting to think of it mainly as a community? Um, you know, there's been lots and lots of research recently, you know, quite in the past looking at soil, you know, physical structure and how we can deal with that. So chemical balance, but now we're starting to learn more and more about the amazing biology that lives within our soil and some of those critical functions that it performs. And actually, if we start to look at the health of our soil, but looking at our soil as an ecosystem or as a community, then we need to make sure that we've got the right balance of all those different types of organisms in terms of bacteria and fungi and other things that mean that our soils are in a good biological balance to fulfill the requirements that we're asking of it. But how do we measure a community? Is it enough to say, well, actually, I know my soil's healthy because I can see earthworms in it? Or do we have to sort of start delving a little bit below those sort of, you know, a bit like if you go, you go, um, you know, and look, look at um, over in Africa and you go on safari, you know, you can see those elephants or you can see those giraffes and you know that that's a good indicator as to everything below it's healthy. Can we do similar things with earthworms? You know, are they, are they what we should be looking at or should we be looking more deeply? And how do we start to measure that? Do we measure it by the things that are there in terms of those, the, you know, the, the presence or absence of those different groups? Or do we measure it by its function? And all of these things are things that, um, you know, are starting to sort of be discussed as this concept of soil health um, really goes up the agenda. But I think what we can all be, we can all agree on in one way or another is that actually we know what unhealthy farm soil looks like. And hopefully none of you have seen, hopefully you haven't seen too many um, of these sort of uh, you know, opportunities or examples of these, but this is what we don't want. This is soil leaving the fields um, and disappearing. And actually that's our most precious resource that actually we now have to have an issue, you know, we now can't get back. And that's not what we want. 
And actually, so we really need to look at designing farming systems and sort of transitioning to those systems which protect our soil in the field, which keep it where we want it in terms of growing crops and don't lose it. So if we look back in terms of that concept of healthy soil and look at how what drives a healthy soil and what are those key components that need to be there in terms of developing and driving healthy soil and healthy ecosystems. What we can see here is that soil health, and, and it can be sort of termed the soil health triangle. Um, I've sort of tried to draw a pretty rubbish Venn diagram here just to show how they're all interlinked. But you can also think of it as a three-legged stool. And in order to achieve soil health, you need all of those legs to be working. And those three legs are soil chemistry, soil physics, and soil biology. And you'll see there in the middle that you'll see SOC. Now SOC stands for soil organic carbon. And soil organic carbon is that sort of connecting thing that connects all three sides of the soil health triangle together. Soil carbon is incredibly important, both in terms of the fundamental building blocks of soil physical structure and being able to actually help that soil structure itself in a way which allows it to perform its function. In terms of providing that fuel which fuels health, uh, those chemical and nutrient cycles to do, and also providing the opportunity in terms of the food that some of that biology needs in terms of doing its function. So it's incredibly important. And we need all three of these sides of it to be functioning well. If we look at soil physical health and soil structure, if you think about how a soil is made up and what, you know, what are its constituent parts, if you think about it, about 45% you know, of our soil is made up of its mineral components. And that's the percentage of uh, different rocks that have gone into it and what's gone on in terms of sand, silt and clay. And we can't do a huge amount about that. You know, we are stuck, we are, we have the soil type that we have on the farm. Um, so that's the bit that we can't do huge amounts about. And that's where we can start to look at what the inherent risks of our soil are. You know, if we've got more clay soils, obviously we're going to have issues in terms of making sure that's well structured um, and also his ability to uh, drain, drain water out of it and hold water and all those sort of things. If we've got more sandy soils, then we're going to have an issue with keeping them in the field and actually holding on to some of that water and that nutrient that we might want later in the season. In a good structured soil, we should then have about a quarter of that soil which is made up of air and a quarter of it which is made up of water. And we do have some more, uh, some more say over how that works in terms of how we manage it and how we manage that structure. And then that last five percent is our organic matter and we'll come back to organic matter and organic carbon in a minute. But of, of that five percent, about 60 percent of that is our sort of stable organic matter and then we've got the rest sort of 20 percent is their active pool so the cycling carbon and then the temp another 20 percent is that more slow cycling carbon but is still slow is still cycling. So how can we manage our soil structure? Well, that's all to do with looking at making sure that we're minimizing compaction. We're looking at the mass of soil, so how densely packed together the soil particles are, and we can use that by looking at bulk density measurements, and looking at how our soil is structured in terms of its aggregate stability, and how stable those aggregates are within the soil structure. If we move on to the sort of chemical health and how we, how we sort of look at that side of it, it's all about making sure that our soils are in balance, both in terms of their pH, which is really, really important. Looking at we've got the right levels of macronutrients and micronutrients and really integrating our nutrient sources together to match crop demand. So making sure that there's a really good nutrient management planning going on and we're looking at what's available in terms of the crop available nutrient, but also the total pools within the soil and looking at how we can work with the biology to start to turn some of that total nutrient into more crop available nutrients. If we take phosphorus, for example, all of the phosphorus that we could ever need in terms of our crop requirement is in the soil. It's just not in a crop available form, but we can work with our soil biology to start to conserve them, to convert some of that into more crop available forms. And then soil biological health. And this is the area that, as I say, there's lots of interest and lots of attention coming on at the moment um, and lots of hopefully opportunities for more in interesting work. But actually, if we've got a balanced soil microbiological biological community, then it will do all the things that we want our soil to do. In terms of, you know, digesting and cycling, improving our soil structure and the rooting depth, so the ability of our plant roots to actually penetrate through that soil surface and go and mine for nutrients, for water, for oxygen. It increases our water holding capacity and our nutrient holding capacity of our soil, which is incredibly important. It produces, you know, produces lots of byproducts that can promote plant growth. 
sequester carbon, which we'll talk a bit more about in a minute, and then also recycle, solubilize, and retain nutrients, all key functions to those healthy, you know, healthy functioning soils that we want. And if we just focus on that soil carbon in a little bit more detail and looking at soil carbon as one of the sort of, uh, you know, potential solutions for climate change. I mean, we're not focusing hugely today on the emissions associated from agriculture. Um, you know, we could do a whole, whole other session on where those emissions are coming from. Um, but what is often, uh, what is often overlooked, uh, and that's why that sort of title says the often overlooked opportunity, when we sort of start talking about agriculture's environmental impact and the, you know, the, the areas on the farm which are producing emissions, we are also one of the only, uh, one of the only industries or the only industry apart from forestry that is able to provide a climate solution when we start looking at the issue around climate change. Yes, we produce some emissions and for agriculture, we're about just under 10% of emissions if you look at UK PLC emissions as a whole. But we have one of the solutions in terms of our ability to pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and hold it on farm. And it may well be held on in our trees, in our woodlands, in our hedgerows, but also in our soils. And one of the other reasons why I've written that, you know, the most uh, often overlooked opportunity is that if you look at some of the sort of policy rhetoric and some of the, the work that's gone on previously, there's been a huge focus on trees. And you could say, well, why, why has there been such a focus on trees? And there's been such a focus on trees because tree carbon sequestration is easy to measure. There's huge amounts of research that's been done by the Forestry Commission and others looking at how much carbon is held by a tree in the soil underneath the tree and then depending on the species of tree and the age of tree what that means in terms of the carbon sequestration rate and then it's very simple if you're looking at policy targets if you're looking at how can you start to increase increase uh, soil carbon increase carbon sequestration you just say brilliant we'll take x numbers of hectares we'll plant it up with these tree species and then we've sorted the problem but as i said at the beginning we've got a huge carbon stock under our feet so we not only have a need to protect that carbon stock that already exists in our soil, but also look at where we have opportunities to increase that. And that's where carbon sequestration comes in. And this was some work that was done by a load of soil scientists back in 2017. Um, and these were some of the sort of top, science, top soil scientists working in this area, which said that soil carbon isn't a magic solution that's going to cure everything. So, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that, but what it does offer us is it offers us the cheapest and the most readily near term implementable option um, in terms of climate solutions at the moment, whilst also contributing to improvements in soil health and other positive environmental um, uh, outcomes on managed land. Fantastic. So even if we're not improving, increasing soil carbon because we want to provide a climate solution, we're just doing it because we want to improve, the, improve our own business and improve the resilience of our fields. That's great because we can do both at the same time. And farmers, uh, landowners and foresters are the ones who can achieve this. So this should be something that we should be celebrating. And as I alluded to earlier, you know, we've now got the magic clause within the policy that says that, you know, soils are a public good building soil resilience and the resilience of our soils to be able to cope with those extreme weather conditions, the ability of our soil to continue to grow, you know, grow crops for us and grow food that we need to feed ourselves is at the heart of this new policy that's coming forward. And I say it's part of that natural capital asset base, but it's also really important to remember that actually it's not just about sequestration, it's also about protecting the asset that we've already got, but it's also about looking at reducing emissions from soils. Because if we can improve um, the structure of our soil, if we can start to make sure that our soils are in a good physical, chemical and biological health, then actually we're going to optimise that system. We're going to reduce the amount of nitrous oxide that's emitted from our soils. And we're going to be able to start to utilise the nutrient base that we've got in our soils as that starting point before adding more in terms of ag fertiliser or manure and the rest of it. So actually that's really important as well. So we have this asset that we can use in terms of our soil health and our soil carbon, both in terms of uh, improving environmental outcomes, but also improving the agronomic productivity of the farm. So how are we going to look after it and how do we protect it? Who potentially might pay for carbon sequestration? And you can see that that graph there is, is the sort of um, you know, figures from Bayes that looks at 
the carbon price that's currently there and the potential growth that is in that industry in terms of a carbon offsetting market and how that might work. And you can see that even, even with the sort of pessimistic price projections, it's still moving in one direction, which is up. So it's certainly something that might be a new business opportunity. So just going back to basics for a minute, what is soil organic carbon? Well, soil organic carbon put very simply is just decomposing plants. It's the energy of the sun flowing through your soil via the plants as they're photosynthesizing. And part of that is pumping carbon in terms of through the root exudates and sugars into the soil. And if you think back to that pie chart I put up earlier around what, how, you know, how a soil is, is made up, 45% of it's rock, 25 water, 25 air, and that remaining 5% is soil organic matter. Well, 60% of that soil organic matter is soil organic carbon. And as we've already touched on, that biology is that underground industry which is supporting the sustainability of your farm, which is really important. And this is just some work that's been done by um, Professor Ratan Lal over in the States, uh, who's one of the very early proponents of uh, soil carbon sequestration and has done loads and loads of different trials. Um, and this is some really good stuff. And again, it sort of goes back to what I was alluding to earlier in terms of even if you're not doing this because you're interested in that climate solution, if you can improve and increase soil organic carbon, you are going to improve your productivity because what happens is that actually you increase all those functions that you want your soil to perform in terms of increased nutrient use efficiency, increased nutrient cycling, infiltration, so the amount of water that is actually absorbed into your soil and held is improved. Porosity, so how those pore spaces within your soil, so those spaces which are made up by air, how, where they are and how they can be used. Water use efficiency, aggregation, so how your soil is structured, all of those things that we want our soils and our healthy soils to be doing in terms of their function are improved by an increase in soil organic carbon. And all those things that we don't want that actually reduce those, so those, those unhealthy soils that I was showing you the picture of earlier, um, we reduce all of those because actually erosion, runoff, compaction, all those things which actually mean that we lose soil disappear. Um, and the other, the other part of this is actually, it's not just about the additional carbon that we can pull in, although you know, that's the key part of it. The other important thing to remember is to protect that carbon that has already been sequestered. And there will be, as I, say, as I said at the beginning, you know, it's one of the biggest stocks of carbon. And that comes from a, rain, you know, a lot of historical land management that's happened in the past. And that carbon is an asset that we need to protect. And a key part of that is actually maintaining aggregation um, so making sure that our structures, um, that our soil is structured in a really good way. Okay, so we need to look at how we can protect the carbon we've already got. But where is this option in terms of potentially making more money from soil carbon sequestration? And how might that work? Well, there's the option of payments for increasing soil carbon. And that might be as a handout from, uh, you know, a sort of subsidy or an ELMS based system or it might be from a, pri a private company wishing to offset their carbon. So that's a, that's a new direct money coming into the farm from one of, one of a couple of different options. But we also have the opportunities, I just showed in that graph a minute ago, to actually increase our output from the farm. So actually pushing those agronomic productivity bits. So increasing the yield or the quality of what we're growing um, by increasing soil carbon. But both of these come down to this question in terms of how do we prove that, that soil carbon is increasing because if we're going to get paid off the back of it we need to prove that actually what we're doing is having an impact in terms of increasing that carbon asset that we have so how do we do it how do we increase soil carbon what are the the options that we have out there or the tools in the box well traditionally when we look at carbon accounting and how we account for the carbon footprints on farms and how we balance emissions and sequestration the traditional way that is seen as the only way that carbon can be, um, you know, increased carbon sequestration can happen, is actually the process of land use change. So if you are um, an arable farm, so you're growing, you know, combinable crops, the only way that you can improve your soil carbon is to transition those fields from arable to grassland, or if you want to supercharge that process, you go straight from arable to uh, woodland. But we know that actually that's quite a blunt instrument, and within those broad categories of different types of land use, we have opportunities to improve it. And put very simply, what we need to do is we either need to stop losing carbon, 
so reducing erosion or reducing tillage so stopping the loss of carbon from our system either out the farm gate as erosion or um, back up to the atmosphere in terms of that carbon loss through cultivation or we need to feed more carbon into the system so we need to start looking at how we can incorporate crop residues how we can put more organic materials back into the system so that we can actually show that we're actually feeding more carbon in and then we also need to look at what we can do and, and how we're starting to incorporate or increase that carbon at different depths. So starting to look at whether we can incorporate more deep rooting species into what we're doing so that we can put that carbon further down the soil profile where it's less likely to be released. So if we look at what those questions might be for policymakers, so how do we start to increase or allow the opportunity that we currently have with woodland through the woodland carbon code and other sort of things how do we start to to do that for soil well we've got a few issues we've got the fact that we're dealing with complex biological systems and you know to a much greater degree than we have with woodland if we're starting to say well actually i'm going to do this practice so i'm going to you know uh, plant a herbal lay i'm going to rotationally graze my cattle i'm going to move to minimal tillage and i'm going to do that it depends on where you put that it depends on previous management there's all these other variables that are in the system because we're not dealing with carbon in isolation we're dealing with carbon in a, you know in in the realm with everything else that's going on and it's not replicable so if, if one farmer over here does something and you then take that exact same management practice and put it over here you may well get completely different results which for a policymaker is an absolute nightmare because what they want is nice simple systems that they can easily put ticks or crosses against or actually put payments against what do we measure and how do we measure it so are we measuring soil organic matter are we measuring soil organic carbon are we measuring something completely different are we measuring biological activity are we measuring emissions coming off and and how do we do it so how often do we measure it uh, do we do it once do we do it every five years and all that sort of stuff needs to sort of be be sort of sorted out can we pay people against it and how do we do it again how often would those payments happen? What would happen in terms of that verification? How would we mitigate against risk? And it's all a bit new and scary, which is what, you know, what the sort of position we're at at the moment. So that's one side of the, of the sort of argument. And for farmers, the questions that we often get, get sort of thrown at us is that actually, you know, we've got this fundamental issue that we need to, soil organic carbon stocks need to be protected and increase and they can have that can happen by a variety of methods so it's not as i say this one magic thing that can that can solve everything and we should be protecting and enhancing it because of its wider role in sustainable management and crop production rather than the fact that we're just going to get a payment off the end of it and actually if you talk to some of the farmers that are already being paid for this around the world again that's the that's the primary driver why they've gone into this because actually they want to increase uh, they want to increase their agronomic productivity they want to increase the performance of their soils the payment is just an extra but within that we need to be providing evidence in terms of what works with the different practices out there so is it is no till better than min till and how does how does no till go with strip till and what's the difference in terms of the carbon from those different things how how diverse does a grass have to be for it to receive those sort of um uh, you know those sort of additional enhanced carbon benefits is it that we have to have just grass clover in our in our forage mixes or do we have to have 17 different species in there and how do we manage them how do we graze them do we cut them all these things need need some information cover crops how again how diverse do our cover crops have to be how long do our cover crops need to be on the ground for do we need to under sow them under our cereal crops and actually do they need to have that consistent green cover what's the benefit how good is it in terms of using manure or digestates or some of these other new products that are coming onto the market and all of that information all of that evidence needs to come from farm level data rather than models because actually that's how we inspire confidence in the industry and all of that starts with knowing what and how to measure and that's what we've been doing in our soil carbon project and our soil carbon project really came about um, from two real things really we've been running it for the last um you know for the last sort of three years now and as i sort of alluded to at the beginning at farm carbon toolkit we run a competition called soil farmer of the year competition and it's a brilliant competition it's in its sixth year this year and its aim is really to promote and champion those farmers who are doing fantastic stuff around sustainable soils management and our top three farmers every year host a farm walk 
and we would go on around their go around their farms and they would take us to some of their fields and they would just say look you know look how amazing my crop looks it's fantastically healthy i have to um, apply less fertilizer to it i have to spray spray for pests less because the soil is more healthy i've cut my diesel bill you know it's fantastic you can see that it looks amazingly healthy you can dig holes you can see worms it's brilliant and my question back to them was always you know it's fantastic it looks brilliant did you bench did you baseline in terms of any soil test before you started on this journey and the overarching answer that always came back was no i didn't um you know and, I, and so i sort of said well why why weren't you testing why didn't you do any testing and there was a sort of range of responses from i didn't really know what to test um i wasn't sure which test to use i'm not convinced they're particularly accurate through to well i was just so excited and i was you know i was going and i wanted to get on with it and then we've also got those questions that i alluded to in that last slide around well what's better herbal lay all these other things and so that's really what we were trying to answer through this project and so we're really trying to understand in more detail three things really. Firstly, how do we test for soil carbon? Is it soil organic matter? Is it soil organic carbon? Is it carbon to clay ratio? Is it total organic carbon closet? All the different tests that are available out there to farmers. Which one works and or which, which few of them work and how robust are they and how accurate are they? Incorporating into that not just which test to use how do we take the samples in the field does it matter how many samples we take does it matter what time of year we take the samples does it matter what depth we take the samples at all of that stuff is really sort of uh, you know sort of bound up in that first thing we're trying to do and we're not just stopping at the field we're also looking at what's going on at the lab so when those samples go off to the lab how are the labs analyzing them do we have consistency across the labs so that's the first thing really sort of sorting out this whole testing area the second part of the project is then saying, okay, once we've sorted out the testing, what are those management practices that make the difference in terms of increasing soil carbon? Or on the other side, releasing soil carbon, so that we can start to put some figures to that. And then the final bit is saying, well, how does soil carbon and what is the potential for soil carbon within the whole farm carbon footprint? So what's the potential for carbon positive farms or the potential for farms to be able to offset emissions from other parts of the industry or from other industries? And how does that all work? And how do we balance it with emissions from that individual farm? We've got 90, uh, just over 90 farmers who are working on the project. You'll see, uh, you'll see from the sort of uh, map there that we've got a high concentration of them in the southwest, both in Devon and Cornwall, because that's where the majority of our funding came from. But we also have um, about so there's about about 60 farmers in the south in Devon and Cornwall, and then about another 30 which are scattered around uh, the rest of England to really try and take into account different soil types, management systems, uh, and different things that are going on. And those farmers are a really valuable knowledge holder in the system because although we can come along and we can do the bring the sort of knowledge and expertise in terms of how we test what they have is that historical knowledge of what's happened on each of those fields that we're working on and it's really important to try and bring that information along with the information that we're finding in terms of sampling and be able to see well what does that show us in terms of the impact of some of these different management practices uh, we're testing a range of things. So we're testing soil organic matter and soil organic carbon at three depths across the field. We're testing, as I say, that some of those other things in terms of carbon to clay ratios, carbon to nitrogen ratios, to uh, total organic carbon, variation across the field and labs. We're testing bulk density, which allows us to give them their carbon yield as well as a percentage. And then at three proxy points, we're also looking at a range of, uh, of, of sort of um, more non-lab based soil assessments. So we're looking at soil structure, we're looking at worm counts and classifications, we're looking at infiltration rate, we're looking at aggregate stability and biological activity to see whether we can actually uh, find any relationship between soil carbon and some of these other things that farmers can look at themselves. And what have we found? And just some summary of what we found, as I say, we're, we're, uh, we're three years into a sort of um, a three and a half, four year project. Um, and this is a great sort of um, saying that I found that actually the best time to start testing for soil organic matter and soil organic carbon was 10 to 20 years ago. The second best time to start is today. Um, so that you can actually have that baseline and start to understand where you are before you start to transition your management. Really important to remember things around, you know, making sure you're sending them to the same lab, you're taking the samples at the same time of year. Um, you know, if you GPS log your where you're taking the samples from, then you can be, make sure that when you go back and test again, um, you know, you're actually taking account of, of what's changed because of your management rather than in-field variation and being very consistent about the depth of your sample. Another really good thing that we found is that actually there is a really good link between soil aggregate stability as a test 
um, and soil organic carbon levels. And you can imagine this, and this is a test that all farmers or anybody can do. You can do it in your gardens, you can do it wherever. Um, go and dig a hole and get a handful of soil. Put that handful of soil on a sunny windowsill or in an airing cupboard to dry for a couple of days. And then take a small aggregate or a small lump and submerge it in water and watch what happens to it. And it's a bit like what happens if you dunk a biscuit in a cup of tea. What you want to happen is that biscuit or that lump of soil to stay together no matter how long it's sitting within the water. And you can see two examples there on that picture. You can see um, a grassland soil, which has a high percentage of soil organic carbon, which is sticking together even though it's in the water. And then you can see that arable soil at the bottom, which is a bit like some of those biscuits that you put in the cup of tea that just go bleh, and you get that sort of sludgy stuff at the bottom. And that's not what we want our soils to do. We want our soils to hold together no matter how, you know, with, with the water, that, if they're submerged in water so that they can keep their structure, they can keep hold of their nutrients and they can do what we want them to do. So it's a really, really good indicator in terms of how healthy your soil is and what we're working on now is saying that actually well could you do soil organic matter lab analyses every five or ten years and in the meantime if you want to see how your soil is transitioning you can start to do these sorts of analysis um, and as I say, this is all of this policy, all of this project information is trying to really feed into this accurate information on how we quantify carbon levels and what the potential is in terms of how of, how long we can do this for, does it reach an optimum, and how we can start to transition this into a payment system. And another really interesting thing we're just doing at the moment is we're taking this information that we've sort of walked the fields and we've got in very very finite detail, and we're starting to try and see whether some of the new precision equipment, so soil scanning technology that's out there whether that can give us uh, detailed enough information to be able to sort of do some uh, automate some of this process so just to conclude really and then i say i'm happy to have a have a sort of discussion uh, or answer any questions um what does all this mean well we have a way now of measuring soil carbon that is verifiable uh, robust and cost effective which is great you know soil health is a public good fantastic that soil health is now mentioned as a public good. But we still need to start to understand what do we pay farmers on? Are we paying them on soil organic carbon? Are we paying them on soil organic matter? Are we paying them on something completely different? And all that is boiled down to how often we're testing, how frequently we're testing, how accurate that testing has to be. And also what can we learn from good practice that's happening around the world? Because um, you know, much as we like to think excuse me, we might to think that we were leading the way and we were leading the way on climate change, um, climate change legislation. Other countries are already doing um, soil carbon trading with farmers um, and they've been doing it for a few years now. So there's, there's developed markets and established markets in Australia, uh, in America, in Canada and in New Zealand. And so actually what can we learn from those systems that are already up and running to help move us quicker on this process so that we can get to a point where we can actually start to pilot some of these systems. And so we need to look at, well, what bits are we gonna take from these global models? So are we going to do payment by measurement, which is what happens in Australia and New Zealand? Are we going to do payment by model, which is what happens in America? Or are we gonna do a hybrid model like what happens in Canada, where it's a mixture of a measurement and a model system? We also need to be very clear in terms of when we're paying that we differentiate between the carbon stock, so our asset that's already there, that's been built up over a number of years and is reliant on some of those historical management practices, and carbon sequestration. And that sequestration is the amount of additional carbon that is pulled in, in in a calendar year that can be used as a genuine offset against the emissions from the farm or from a, wide, or from a wider area. And it's really important to differentiate those. And I think what will happen is that we will have two very different sets of payments. Uh, we will have a payment for protection, which may well sit within the ELMS or the Environmental Land Management System. And we have a payment for additional carbon that's pulled in, which may well sit within private finance. And just moving on from that, there is a lot of private finance interest at the moment. There are lots of new companies setting up and there are lots of big businesses which are having to pay uh, carbon offsets uh, that want to do that with farmers. And just, just to sort of bring it back around in terms of towards sustainable soils management, you know, we've still got a lot to learn. There's a really good sort of quote, which is that we know more about the surface of the moon than we do than what's under our feet. And there's fantastic, you know, there is fantastic work going on, but we need to do more of it. And we need to learn more about one of our most precious resources. Um, and for farmers really, and, and, and on their sort of transition to, to the journey of regenerative agriculture, a, a good guiding philosophy to really sort of look at is, is does an input that you want to put on or a practice increase or decrease soil health? 
you know, and just using that as a sort of guiding principle and following those guiding principles that, that have been sort of pioneered by those, those early adopters of regenerative agriculture in terms of, you know, keeping a living root in the soil all the time, in terms of making sure that the soil surface is covered, making sure that you disturb it as little as possible, will allow us to start to build up those really, uh, you know, resilient systems that have soil health in the centre. We need to be building soil health over the long term. It is a long term goal. OK, we need to be looking at how we can protect what we've already got and how we can build it you know, over the long term and how we can do that, not just for our sort of short term gain and agronomic gain on the farm, but how we can do that as a long term climate solution. But we also need to be mindful of the short term issues. I mean, what we've got and there's quite an interesting uh, discussion to be had around around land tenure and around you know, those farmers who are on short term land tenancies. And how do we start to incentivize those farmers to actually start to protect their soil health where they potentially are only in a sort of, you know, one, two year agreement where they're renting that land? Where actually what they're most, you know, they've got high rents and how do they start to do that? So there's a, there's a, there's a sort of bigger question there about how we value it. But the really exciting thing that we found from our project is that we can measure soil carbon. So this is brilliant. This is the first step, which we can then start to sort of work all the rest of it out. And so we now need to pilot schemes for payment mechanisms that reward farmers rather than aggregators. One thing that we don't have that some of those other countries that um, are already already doing this sort of thing is our scale of farming is much is much smaller. And so we need to create systems that allow farmers to be uh, you know to, to be rewarded from this rather than having to sort of create a sort of brokerage system which uh, means that the risk the risk isn't is taken by the farmer but the reward goes somewhere else. And that's really important to remember. So I think that's probably the end of what um, I have to say. Um, I'm happy to, to take questions um, or comments. As I say, if anybody's got any, any comments or anything, um, then do please shout. Thank you. Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> um, I think we have like we have one question. So if anyone else has um, questions, please um, just type in the question and answer box. So um, there's one question from Steve Earring. Um, in 2009, I worked on an EU project entitled BioAcro, creating Sweden's first large biochar carbon sequence yep. within the agricultural field. The biochar was and still is produced from residue biomass streams from industrial seed production. They have achieved the European biomass certificate, um, biochar, sorry, biochar certificate for the um, biochar they produce and have circulated that each ton of their biochar is 78% pure carbon and embodies 2.57 tons of um, embedded carbon. While manufacturing, it emits only 0.05 tons of um, embedded carbon. So um, what are your thoughts on biochar? I think that's a general question. Okay, yeah, no, that's fine. So biochar is one of those really interesting, um, interesting things, which um, if you look at, uh, you, you tend to get, um, uh, it goes in sort of cycles of, of who's researching it and, and whether, you know, whether those people are talking to policymakers. So certainly if you look at the NFU um, road to 2040 net zero, because obviously we've got, you know, net zero legislation for the UK of 2050 and the NFU have said that agriculture, we need to be net zero by 2040. And one of their key uh, mitigation strategies that they've got within that is the is increasing the adoption and use of biochar. If we're looking at it in terms of a carbon um, you know, a carbon uh, carbon benefit. It has a carbon benefit because, as you, as as you said, it's you know seventy eight percent pure carbon, and you're putting that carbon source within the soil. So you are you are you know burying that carbon, and it's in quite an inert form. So actually, it's not gonna it's not gonna then be emitted back up, which is great. Okay, so we're taking carbon and we're burying it in the soil and we're leaving it there. The interesting bit for me. And I'd be interested to hear whether you um, whether you whether you did any work on this. Is its um, you know its benefits in terms of improved soil health. 
and there's quite a lot of um, there's quite a lot of conflicting uh, reports out there. Some people who um, who who have get really really good results with it in terms of improved uh, water holding capacity, in terms of improved biological activity, and others who don't. And I think that's where we really need to look at. You know, yes, I have no arguments with it as a carbon storage thing. I think I think it it does that because it's carbon and you're putting it somewhere and it's an inert. So, but what what the really interesting bit would be in terms of its ability um, its ability to improve soil health and its ability to behave as a soil conditioner and starting to be able to understand the uh, you know the benefits that can happen in terms of potentially improved uh, you know improved biological function improved nutrients and all those sort of things which come from it and so we've certainly got We've got two farms on the soil carbon project who are applying biochar uh, at different rates, and uh, the biochars come from different uh, from different original material. Um, and certainly, as I say, we've seen an increase in terms of uh, in terms of carbon percentage in the soil, obviously. But what we're really looking at, and we're doing some work at the moment to see whether we can actually pick up uh, any differences in terms of the uh, biological breakdown and the balance. So are we getting increased, um, you know, fa uh, increased fungal to bacterial ratios? Are we getting uh, any other benefits from that? And I think that's, if we can start to understand that in a bit more detail, that will hopefully be where we'll start to get increased, um, you know, increased take up of these sort of things. But, you know, the size of the challenge in terms of reaching net zero is huge and we need to we need to employ all of the tools that we have in the box to do that so hopefully that's answered your question there's another question um from francesca moore yeah so, um first of all fantastic webinar thank you um what are your thoughts on link between chemical inputs and soil biological communities my reading suggests chemical input break the trade between them carbon for nutrient having implication for the nutrient dense our food is or how a nutrient dense our food is for me this is one of the biggest selling points of regenerative farming practice this implication for all our health so yeah fan fantastic comment slash question um it's 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 the sort of as we as we start to transition and understand more about soil biological communities and how that all works and that and as i say this this advent of being able to track nutrients up from the soil through you know through the plants and all the rest of it then we can start to really understand this in more detail and there's been some really there's been some really interesting work recently and obviously um a lot of the regenerative agriculture um you know sort of uh, thus far has been you know the the move away from the move away from cultivation uh, and the move towards sort of you know increased cover crops increased crop residues all those sort of things but a lot of that comes with the idea that at some point you have to spray you know you have to spray uh, herbicides on there you have to put you know you have to sort of add those add those things in and when we're talking about a truly regenerative system and if you think about a plant root so if you're a plant root and you're in the soil and you know you've got the you know you're adapted to basically being fed from above so you are drip fed fertilizer brilliant you know you have those things that you want you know those plants will become lazy and those plants won't then forage they won't get longer roots that actually can go down into the soil and find the things they want because it's coming from above you know it's a bit like if you think about what we eat you know you could get the same you know you could sit there and open your mouth and somebody could throw biscuits in it or you could go out and pick some carrots and you know or, or, or do that sort of thing you know there's a the lazy option versus the option to get those calories you've got to expend more energy and all the rest of it and and this is something which i think we we really do have an opportunity to really start to revolutionize our food system and and, and what i was just talking about um, you know, with soil, uh, with soil being classified as a public good and the ability to pay people on that. I think the real opportunity lies with us linking, um, linking farming into public health, you know, and the ability of, of our farmers, not just to, not just to produce food as a commodity, but the ability to start to link nutrient density of that food and actually start to see our farmers as health providers. You know, and if you look at some of the nutritional issues that we have um, as a society, you know, if we can start to, to sort of really link up the fact that if we can have these regenerative systems, which don't just, 
uh, you know, improve our soils, but they actually provide us with, with much more, with much more healthy and nutrient dense food because we're not relying on, you know, on feeding it a bag of 20, 10, 10 and actually doing all those sort of things, which means that actually we're not building up those fungal networks in the soil that actually start to allow all our biology to do what it needs to do. We're not actually creating the uh, the environment that allows that biology to do what it wants to do. And there's some really exciting research going on. So obviously we're, all of our research is happening um, in terms of looking to try and quantify this at the soil level. There's some work that was uh, done over in the States um, and was at Groundswell a couple of years ago where they've actually developed a, an infrared scanner and you can scan the food and they've been doing it on carrots uh, and they've also been doing it on broccoli. Um, and they found that actually you can tell the difference uh, in terms of the nutrient density of that product that's come from a farm that's used, uh, you know, regenerative or holistic practices and those that haven't. And that's, that's potentially game changing. Because then, you know, we don't need to worry about the stuff that I do. Hopefully that means that I don't need to do what I need to do in terms of looking at, you know, carbon. We don't need to start having complicated discussions about carbon. We just say, brilliant, you scan it and it's better for you because it's got more nutrients in it. So actually it's just, it, and that then means that in order to get that, you've got to, you've got to transition your food system and you've got to transition your farming practices to do that. And so that I think will, will change it. I and mean, you're completely right. If you look at, you know, there's some work that's been done by Newcastle University looking at, how you know the the the, the uh, what's in our food in terms of those key vitamins and minerals, um, and you compare them to what what was there 30 years ago, and that you know there's about a sixth of what there should be, and a lot of that you are right has come from um, an overuse of a lot of um, you know a lot of inputs that are being used, and if you think you know we've had this sort of um, you know this of this sort of um, you know reliance and and the research that's come out uh, looking that's been pushed. Uh, you know, and I'm, I'm probably being slightly cynical, but a lot of the advice that's gone out to farmers has come from agronomy companies and those agronomy companies are there to try and sell you products. And the advice is linked with product selling. And the whole issue with this new way of looking at it in terms of regenerative farming is that you're not selling them any product because they don't need it. So actually we need to decouple and they're just starting to do this in France. We need to decouple the selling of products from the advice and actually start to, you know, the advice needs to be much, much wider and much wider reaching than just thinking, well, actually, what are you trying to grow in this field? This is, you know, this is what I'm going to make you, you know, this is what I'm going to re recommend you in terms of what you apply, because I want to make sure that you want my business next year. And actually, in order to do that, I may go, I may say that actually you're going to put a little bit more on to guarantee your yields and all the rest of it. But if you look at, um, whereas if you say, actually, let's take a step back from what I'm trying to sell you as a chemical or a fertilizer and actually say, what do you want to achieve and how do we get there? And actually go very much back to, well, what's going on in the soil? You know, is your soil in the right structural condition? What are you doing in terms of rotation? Are you improving diversity? Are you including, you know, all these other things, which, which mean actually looking at, at the, at the farm as a whole, as a, in terms of a, a series of assets that you can use to sort of do different things. It's really, that's, that's where we need to transition to. And, you know, as I say, once you start to decouple that, it gets quite interesting. And I think also, you know, being able to look at, uh, you know, we need a level of, a level of sort of carbon literacy, which is starting to, is starting to come within the farming sector, which, which allows them to be able to, to understand some of these trade-offs and how it all works. But yeah, I mean, you know that that's the next exciting bit is when we then link it into into human health okay becky um, oh hi becky it's uh narash hello hi there uh thanks for the presentation sorry i, I put this in the q a but sitting on the panel i don't think i'm able to um but i've got a question which is um i appreciate there's probably a lot of science that needs to happen to get to that stage but um thinking about farming and sustainability and the consumer um, what are your thoughts and you know is anyone working on potentially developing a, a standard which you know people can put on products and say this is uh, this is produce that's come from a sustainable soil farm because I think that for, from a from a consumer point of view there's a huge movement in terms of eating ethically and in an environmentally sta uh, friendly standard and I think that's probably something that the farmers will want to be receptive to. Yeah I, you make a really good point and it's it's um, it's quite interesting because obviously there are already there are already some labels that are put on food. So, for example, you can choose to buy organic 
uh, or not and obviously you have two you know there's two different certification bodies for organic in the uk um now if you're talking strictly on a um on a soil carbon point of view um obviously organic uh, farmers aren't able to use uh, chemicals in terms of uh, you know dealing with weeds or pests and so they tend to rely on a lot more cultivation so you're you're you know potentially got more losses of carbon but you, you know it all balances out with other greenhouse gas emissions and the rest of it but um and 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 then you also have you know sort of other other different product marks that are there in terms of leaf certification, which is looking at um, looking at has has a sort of integrated farm management system. But so so there are lots of discussions going on at the moment about whether we need a new standard or whether it's that existing standards um, start to include more about soil uh, as part you know because as part of what they've already got and and whether. And whether it's seen as a carbon compliance thing so whether you know whether we say actually you know you've got sort of like farm assurance so you know which is based on sort of welfare standards and so you know if you want to sell your uh, your meat or your eggs or your veg or whatever you have to you know you have to produce it in terms of that red tractor because that's what you know that's what we need and and so the question really and it'd be interesting to to sort of throw it back to you and see what your thoughts are is do we have carbon and soil health as a compliance thing so everybody has to achieve you know this this level and it's just understood that you know if you see a red tractor or you know whatever that then they are doing good in terms of soil management or is it more of a an added value thing and actually you then have it you know like we have organic or or other things like that so it's it's that it's an it's a sort of additional standard or an additional level of um level of certification that 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 you aspire to and then and then you reach and and that's and that's that's the sort of um dilemma at the moment you know there is a certain level of soil protection that every farmer has to do anyway as part of cross compliance it's just um you know as we start to transition do you know do, does and it's when we start to get there's you know there's lots of discussion in the industry at the moment about whether we need a regenerative or a regenerative logo or a regenerative label, uh, you know, or a regenerative sort of validation system that's actually more than organic, um, you know, because it's actually a, a different set of principles. It's not about saying, you know, you must never apply fertilizer, you must never apply um, a crop protection product. It's about understanding what you're trying to achieve as a whole farm system. And, you know, regenerative farming isn't just about, uh, you know, saying you mustn't do this, you mustn't do this. It's about also saying, well, what is my you know what is my uh, place within the wider environment within the wider ecosystem and how does what i do complement complement that stuff so so would you would you ex you know would you expect it as a sort of you know if you saw something that said it was you know red tractor and all the rest of it would you expect that that was produced to high uh, sort of carbon or soil standards or would you be willing to pay extra for it um I would be willing to pay extra for it. I think that comes down to consumer choice, though. Yeah. Um, I mean, what was the what was the first point again? If it's, would you be willing to pay extra for it? Yeah, I mean, would it be yeah? Would it be something that we would just expect all farmers to to reach as a standard? Because this is what we you know this is what we we say in an era post cap and you know our new agricultural bill. You know, we expect that our farmers comply with you know with with high soil management and in these sort of systems. Or is it that we say actually, you know, we this is a this is a this is an additional thing which which you know we we pay for and, and it's all to play for at the moment, you know. So we do, yeah. Uh, should there not be um, a minimum standard, and then if there are farmers who want to go above and beyond, they would do that if they are if they feel that the benefits of doing so are, yeah. are justified enough. If they feel like going above and beyond gives them a commercial advantage for example then yeah. but i feel like there should be a minimum standard and then yeah. there should be mechanisms or opportunities for farmers who want to go above that yeah and i think that i think that will come there's certainly some interesting work going on with uh so waitrose have been doing something with their dutchy originals brand uh, in terms of looking at transitioning those over to regenerative farming and there's some other bits and pieces going on and i think it, it you know you, you bring up a big issue and it's it's how do we how do we communicate it in a way to the consumers which is simple yeah. easy to understand and can fit neatly on a packet and if you've got the answer to that then you're going to make a lot of money yeah i i, th I think that's that's something Cons consumer trust as well because um 
I mean, you have a lot of standards around the, the seafood market as well, but there's also uh, things coming out about how robust those standards are. Um, yeah. So, it, yeah, I, I don't have the answer to that, but yeah, consumer trust and consumer faith in, in the products. And I mean, that's, that's got to be a, a huge um, driver for the Southwest as well, as we're so reliant down here on agriculture that yeah. we can't afford to compromise on those standards and those principles. Um, because you know, I've I've lived down in the southwest for four years now, and you know, there's a real pride and passion in terms of the um, locally sourced produce, and it is something as a region to be proud of. So, yeah, something that I'd I'd like to think that farmers wouldn't compromise on, and um, something that you'd like to think would be transferred in terms of um, consumer trust. Yeah. And I think we have a real good opportunity to, to, to pioneer that with this because those farmers that have been those sort of early adopters of regenerative farming and we have we have a lot of them in the southwest, you know, are are keen to, to capitalise on, on the back of it. I mean, the interesting thing in terms of, you know, the sort of um, push to do it is that, um, you know, the majority of them actually reduce their costs dramatically um, and actually are in a much better financial position. They might have, they might not get the sort of, you know, down the pub boasting high yields in terms of, you know, they are up at 12 tonnes a hectare, but the cost to get them there has been a lot less. So actually their margins are a lot higher. And especially when we've had, you know, we've had a really, really awful um, wheat harvest this year, um, you know, really, really pants. Um, and you think actually the ones that are laughing are, are the ones that actually have had a much lower cost base um, in terms of what they've put on those crops. So, you know, although they've had, they've, they've had just a pound to harvest, but actually the cost that they've put into it is much less. So, you know, and it's, it's about how do we, you know, the, the, it's, it, it, it's just back in terms of how do we start to communicate that in a way which, which, which is simple and easy to understand for our consumers. And, and without, uh, the other thing is without doing down other farmers you know that's the other thing it's it's not a, it's not about saying this is the only way it's about how do we transition over into a way you know and this is one of the things that's quite often uh, you know sort of touted with organic versus conventional you know and organic sometimes you know has a lot of we're better than them mentality the lovely thing with regenerative farming is it it's not it's not exclusive to one farming sector. Everybody can start to look at it and understand it. Everybody can improve how they're managing their soils. It's very inclusive rather than, so we need to try and sort of do that in a way which encourages farmers to, to sort of help, help them on their, on their transition really. Brilliant. Thank you. Yes, yeah, um, question for you um, from Stephen Irving. Thanks, Becky. I noticed that the food company Corn by introducing the, the ga uh, greenhouse gas emissions on their food, on the labelling. I personally like this approach of linking food to GHG emissions, as it will hopefully su help support the local economy. Do you agree or disagree? I agree with some caveats uh, in the fact that the problem that we have with uh, carbon footprinting is that we need a set of standards which are, um, which are, uh, which are the same across all industries. So corn is a great example. Um, and we've had other examples in the past of uh, people who put their carbon footprints on, but actually they, they potentially aren't taking into account some of the things that go into it. Or, you know, we don't have that cons consistency as well. As before. We don't have that consistency in terms of metrics. Um, and I would love to see in the future that potentially we have, you know, if we have carbon footprints on, on, uh, on packaging, but like I said to Naresh a minute ago, they need to be understandable by our consumer. They walkers and walkers and uh, Tesco put a load of carbon footprints on their products a few years ago. So it told you that there were 57 grams of carbon in a packet of crisps and it told you that there was uh, two kilos or something of carbon in a, in a four pint of milk. And they put them on and then they realized that actually they didn't mean anything to anybody. And so they took them off. And that's one of the problems that we've got with carbon footprinting is that a value is great, but we also need to understand whether that's a good value or a bad value. And, and carbon, our carbon, literacy is quite is is not great because we can't we don't you know we all find it difficult if i said to you you know how how much space would a ton of carbon dioxide you know actually show you know it's really difficult to start to understand these sort of things so we've got to we've got to visualize it in a way which makes sense to the consumer so potentially a sort of i don't know red amber green like we do with some of the other nutritional nutritional stuff on 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 packets might work but i do think the carbon footprinting is 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 a way that we can 
pick up all these things because it does not just take into account emissions it's also looking at sequestration but we've got to have that consistently applied across across the industry and that's what we're waiting for some guidance from government to be able to ha make that happen soon okay I think there are no more questions unless somebody I think there were two hands up but I don't know if they wanted to ask a question or not otherwise I guess you um, explained a very complex topic <laughs> um, quite well and you know um, there are no more questions left um, so it's very informative so thank you um, lots of yeah lots of um, different aspects and um, Thank you. <laughs> That's all right, no worries.